Usaka Saka, bon, and welcome to part nine of the read aloud of Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino Rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. So, in the last video, we stopped at the end of section A of chapter 19. So, today we'll be starting at section B of chapter 19 the rebellion of the Caciques of Boriquen between AD 1509 and 1519. Barely five years after the decisive defeat of Cotubanamá and the Allied chiefs of Higüey, Juan Ponce de León, who had participated as captain and economically benefited from the battles, set sail to colonize Puerto Rico. News about the potential gold riches to be obtained from the island of San Juan, today Puerto Rico, came to Ponce de León by way of the Indians of Higüey, who were assigned to his household. Quote, Juan Ponce de León had news from some Indians that served him that in the island of San Juan, or Borigueng, there were plenty. there was plenty of gold, because being neighbors to the Indians of this province of Higüey, they were the closest, and being the nearest landing from the islands of St. Juan, and with no more than 12 or 15 leagues of distance, every day they went in their canoes or small boats from the island, being Hispaniola, to the other one, and those from that island, Borigueng, to this one and they thus communicated. This is how ones and the others knew what was in the land of each other, end quote. As several authors have noted, previous short-lived explorations in Puerto Rico, such as those of Vicente Yanez Pinzon and Martin Garcia de Salazar, also brought early news of the potential that Puerto Rico offered for gold and other resources, including an untapped Indian labor, fo labor force. These resources were important as the availability of native labor in Hispaniola became increasingly critical as a result of the disruption of food production that followed on the heels of previous conquest battles, not just Higüe. The fall of food supplies stemmed from the fact that the natives who had been, quote, liberated, end quote, by the rebellious Francisco Roldán were no longer harvesting for Bartolomé and Diego Colón, the son, not the brother, of the admiral and the latter's men. It is possible that Ponce de Leon had also been to Puerto Rico earlier in 1506. The suggestion arises from a document titled Provanza de Juan González that included depositions by members of Ponce de Leon's party. Their testimonies indicate that there may have been an earlier expedition in 1506. They noted that Ponce reached the south coast and stayed at the settlement of a cacique named Mabo el Grande, or the Great while Juan González, the son of Ponce de León and an expert interpreter of Taino language, marched with some 50 men across the Cordillera Central towards the large bay, today Bahia de San Juan, that the natives had reported to exist on the north coast. Along the way, they passed numerous villages and continued the pattern of gift, and perhaps name, exchanges. Meanwhile, Ponce de León left Mabo's settlement and the domain of Aguaybana and sailed west, and then north and east along the coast of Puerto Rico. As Karen Anderson Cordova noted, the date, 1506 versus 1508, may be just a confusion, but it is possible that Ponce de Leon had been there earlier for an initial exploration and to establish contacts with local caciques, such as Mabo el Grande, who may have been an ally or subordinate of Aguaybana the Elder. What is interesting here is that as the ground party crossed numerous settlements in the central mountains, like Utuado, Hayuya, Orocovis, gift exchanges regularly took place between local chiefs and the Spaniards, which probably included name exchanges and also, I suspect, Guaisas. Ponce de Leon's own testimony is that he began preparations for the expedition in the late summer of 1508, having obtained license from the governor, Comendador Mayo Frey Nicolás de Obando, to officially explore Boriquen, Ponce readied for departure from Salva León del Higüey, today Boca del Yuma. But on August 3, 1508, a hurricane arrived, causing damages and delay. Ten days later, Ponce finally departed and foundered on Amona, today's Mona Island, where he interviewed two caciques. That same day, he arrived at a site somewhere along the southwest coast of Puerto Rico, a region controlled by an important cacique, Aguaybana I. This chief was regarded by the Spaniards as the ruler of a cacigazo that later his historiography labored Guainia, located on a broad stretch of the south coast more or less centered on today's city of Ponce. Even though 
From the Spaniards' perspective, Aguaybana was indeed, quote, paramount, end quote. There is considerable disagreement among scholars on whether he was, indeed, a paramount chief ruling over second-ranked chiefs and their polities, or even whether this polity was a chiefdom in the classical anthropological sense. Seventy-three years later, a memorial sent to King Philip II and signed by Juan Margarejo, then governor of San Juan, stated, quote, in this island there was no cacique that lorded over all of it, except that in each valley or principal river there was a cacique that had other capitanes and their lieutenants who served him and who were called in their language mitainos, end quote. This statement may be an exactingly accurate memory or, just as likely, a recollection of a past already marred by the encomienda system in which any such paramount chiefs who might have existed had long since been forgotten. The archaeological data required to support or refute the presence of paramount casigazos is simply not available yet. For this first expedition to Puerto Rico, Ponce had specific instructions. One, to leave with 50 men. Two, to speak with Cacique Aguaybana on behalf of the king so as to establish large plantation-sized conucos to ensure a subsistence base to support the Spanish colonists. And three, to found a settlement a uh, casa fuerte, or fort house, and a port to be conveniently located to exploit and explore, to exploit and export gold. The defeat of the caciques of Higüey was well known in Boriquen by the time Ponce de León met Aguaybana I in 1508, if not in 1506. Such knowledge no doubt affected the way in which both Aguaybana I and Ponce de León negotiated the terms for the Spanish presence in Boriquen. The battles in Higüey had apparently convinced Ponce de León that diplomacy and negotiation were better alternatives than outright conquest by arms, while Aguaybana, advised in no small way by his mother, also favored his diplomatic strategy of tolerance, given the disastrous consequences in the Higüey. The sad news of the massacres of the Higüey, not to mention the prior collapse of the unquestionably powerful Casigazos of Maguana, Gallabo, and Bainoa a few years earlier, had swiftly traveled across the Mona Passage. Juan Ponce de Leon was received by Aguabana I, his mother, and his foster father in his settlement near the mouth of the Guayuco River. As was customary among the natives, Ponce de Leon, quote, was well received and feasted, offering him those things that the Indians have for their maintenance, being food, and showing to him that he, Aguabana, was pleased to know him and be a friend of the Christians, end quote. Once the pact was in place, Aguaybana I exchanged his name with Juan Ponce, thus becoming Guatiao, quote, which was a signal among the Indians of these islands of perpetual confederation and friendship, end quote. This pact was further solidified by Aguaybana's gesture of giving Ponce de Leon, quote, one of his sisters, end quote, not, as Ovedo declared, as a, quote, friend, end quote, but from Aguaybana's perspective as a bride. On the third day, August 16th, a second hurricane breached the island. While apparently this did not stop Ponce de Leon from pushing forward, the combined effects of back-to-back -back hurricanes on the agricultural fields must have been quite severe. The high precipitation and flash floods that commonly follow hurricanes would have wiped out the canucos and perhaps even settlements, creating shortages in the food supply. Ponce, however, succeeded in getting Aguaybana and his allied, or perhaps subordinated, caciques to, quote, sell Casa Vabred at a good price, end quote, to the Spaniards. Hurricanes notwithstanding, Ponce and his 50 men, perhaps led by Aguaybana himself, began to explore the south and east coast, searching for a convenient place to build the fort house close to gold-bearing rivers such as Cibuco and Manatuabon. They finally reached the north coast, where he came upon a bay facing the mouth of the Ana River, possibly the Manati River. The party stayed there for a month. From there, they explored the land to the east as far as the Toa Valley. However, the Ana Bay was subject to strong tidal changes, making it unsafe as a harbor. As a result, Ponce and 15 of his men traveled by land to the south coast of today's San Juan Bay. The settlement would later, in 1514, be sacked by the natives, conveniently labeled as Caribes by the Spaniards, and eventually relocated in 1519 to the islet of Puerto Rico that is present-day Old San Juan. Farther west of Caparra, in the fertile Toa Valley, the royal hacienda of Toa was established 
for agricultural production in order to sustain the colonial gold mining enterprise served by hundreds of native laborers. Cristobal de Sotomayor, who became Ponce's alcalde mayor or chief justice from Andalusian Arabic alcalde, alcalde, meaning, quote, to take charge of government, end quote. Sotomayor arrived in 1519, 1509, sorry, with license to establish a settlement somewhere in Boriquen. By October, the crown had recognized Diego Colón as the rightful heir and reinstated him as admiral and governor of the Indies, relieving Fray Nicolás de Obando of his functions. Don Diego designated the brothers Juan and Martín Cerrón as, respectively, alcalde mayor and alcalde, or mayor or justice. Ponce de León decided to recognize the new appointments and yield the government to the Cerrón brothers. It was Juan Cerón in 1509 who ordered the first repartimiento of Indians of Boriquen among the Spanish colonists, an act that would directly lead to the noted rebellion of the caciques barely two years later. By the end of 1509, Cristobal de Sotomayor and his nephew arrived in, on the island. Sotomayor was a well-connected nobleman having served, among other things, as secretary to King Philip, quote, the handsome, end quote, of the Habsburg dynasty, and to whom Ferdinand, quote, the Catholic, end quote, had already assigned lands and Indian laborers. Juan Serón was, was keen to extend Spanish control to the south of the island, for which reason he ratified, with some amendments, Ferdinand's assignment of lands and Indians to Sotomayor. Among the assigned Indians was La Guaybana I, with whom Ponce de Leon had exchanged, had exchanged names in 1508. Shortly upon arrival to Boriquen, Sotomayor founded the village of Tabora, or Tabara, his maternal surname, possibly located near today's Guanica Bay on the south-central side of the island. Sotomayor was a supporter of Columbus's interests and a political competitor of Ponce de Leon, who was favored by Nicolás de Obando before Don Diego's appointment by King Ferdinand in 1509. Later, during the first months of 1510, Sotomayor relocated the village to the west coast some four leagues distance, perhaps near today's Añasco, near the mouth of the Guaurabo River. The new settlement was renamed Villa de Sotomayor. According to Suez Badillo, the change was made to gain better access to the gold resources and, more important, because of Sotomayor's persistent problems in getting the local caciques to send him the native labor to work the conucos and mine for gold. Only a few months after Don Diego Colón named Juan Serón as alcalde mayor, Juan Ponce de Leon received a royal decree from King Ferdinand reinstating him as captain governor with full civil and judicial jurisdiction of Boriquen and the authorization to appoint magistrates. Ponce took this opportunity to imprison Juan Serón and send him to Spain. Don Diego Colón, famously aggrieved by the intrusion of King Ferdinand in what he felt was his authority, confiscated all of Ponce de León's assets in Boca de Yuma. Ponce de León, let us not forget, was a business partner of the king in the royal hacienda in Toa, and his interests and loyalty were with the monarchs, and not the Columbus family. Ponce, however, mindful of Sotomayor's personal connections with King Ferdinand, had designated Don Cristobal de Sotomayor as alcalde mayor, despite the latter being favored by Don Diego Colón. Ponce de León began to move towards more autonomy from Santo Domingo and the Columbus family. He requested and obtained permission to bring Franciscan friars to evangelize the Indians and, perhaps more important, for the right to smelt gold in Caparra, the royal hacienda in the Toa Valley just west of Caparra with its Indian demora or labor period supplied food for the colonial enterprise. Some Spaniards also settled in the Toa and Cibuco Valleys to more comfortably exploit the rich gold placers nearby. The foundation of Villa de Sotomayor in 1509 and the existing Caparra and nearby Toa in 1508 created two polar areas of Spanish colonial activities. In 1514, following royal instructions and after the rebellion of the caciques, the administration of the island was divided into Partido de San Germán to the west and Partido de Caparra to the east, each enjoying, for a while, a certain degree of autonomy. 
The demarcation between the two partidos was established by the course of the Camuy River on the northern coast to its headwaters and the Hakaguas River on the southern coast to its source in the central highlands. On May 1, 1509, Ponce de Leon had to return briefly to Santo Domingo to deal with his governorship appointment and to restock supplies to ship back to Puerto Rico. He also, quote, brought with him Cacique Aguaybana to see the things of the islands of La Hispaniola, end quote. Whether or not this was Aguaybana's first visit to Hispaniola, there's tentative evidence that he had relatives living there. In the list of the Repartimiento de Indios dating to 1514, there is one cacique named Fra Francisco de Aguaybana from Saona Island, who was assigned to King Ferdinand to work in the royal haciendas and gold mines, quote, for the estates and mines and farms of the king, our lord, which he has in the city of Santo Domingo and its limits, he was assigned cacique Francisco de Aguaybana of Saona, which are 77 men and 86 women, end quote. Las Casas also added that Aguaybana of Saona was, quote, a great cacique and señor whose lands in señorío, or fiefdom, was five or six leagues up the coast towards the east and was named Aguaybana, end quote. He also noted that the admiral had ordered him to plant 80,000 montones of crops, mainly cultivated with manioc, manioc being yuca. The monton was an artificial mound of topsoil that had specific dimensions, 9 to 12 feet on each side, with the Spanish adopt, which the Spanish adopted as a standard unit of measure in agricultural production. Given such a name, the Aguaybana of Saona Island may have been related to the two Aguaybanas of Guainia in Puerto Rico, although this is speculative. However, there is little doubt about another cacique from the Higüey region named Andres. He was a relative of the Aguaybanas of Boriquén. What remains unknown is precisely how Cacique Andres was related to the Aguaybana brothers. Was it by marriage or by blood? In any case, a binding connection between Higüey and Guainia chiefs is documented. Archaeologist Miguel Rodriguez Lopez recalls coming across a copy of a Spanish written document held or seen by Don Ricardo Alegría in which the following scene was described and paraphrased here. A Spaniard was supervising the assigned Indians doing labor in the field somewhere in eastern Hispaniola. One of the natives, though, was hanging around just watching the activities. The Spaniard then approached the cacique in charge and asked him why that fellow was not working like the rest. The reply was that the native was a visiting cacique, a relative from Boriquen. If this account could be confirmed, it would add significantly to the evidence of the close-knit relationships between the chiefs on both sides of the Mona Passage and of the frequent visits between them. Whether they were marital alliances or blood ties between chiefs of Boriquen and Higüe, these relations underpin the proposed web across the Mona Passage, through which the semi-idols and other economic goods, services, for example, military support, and information flowed. The restricted geographic distribution of stone collars, elbow stones, large stone heads, and large decorated three-pointed semis is a reflection of these close relationships between the caciques, particularly if the Aguaybana blood kin network across the Mona Passage was already several generations deep into the pre-Columbian past. The geographic distribution of semi-icons especially the stone collars and elbow stones and the three-pointers attached to the stone collars, parallel the same spatial limits of the alliance or descent network of the historic caciques, the two Aguaybanas and Andres. There are archaeological indicators that such chiefly alliances were forged several generations earlier. At the El Cabo site near Cabo de San Rafael in the Higüey, a fragment of coarse or bench type limestone collar was found associated with anadel or transitional ceramic components. Recent excavations at the El Cabo site yielded dates between AD 600 and AD 980 for the earlier anadel or osteonin osteonoid occupation and AD 980 to 1440 for the later Boca Chica component and continued into the early 16th century as demonstrated by the presence of Maholica wares. At this site, two fragments of slender collars, the ring portion, 
made of exotic igneous stone were found associated with house structures and the late Boca Chica occupation, supporting Walker's seriation and evolution of the Puerto Rican collars. Furthermore, during the 2007 season, a large decorated three-pointed stone, anthropomorphic with legs and head on the lateral prominence, was also found in the house area. In contrast to the exotic stone collar fragments, the large three-pointed semi was made of locally abundant limestone. Two simple, or miniature, three-pointers were also found in and around the house area. These iconic, emblematic, and potent objects worn and used by caciques are, in my view, a strong indication that the web of alliances via intermarriage or descent relations between chiefs, such as the historic Aguaybana and Cacique Andres, across the Mona Passage are indeed ancient, potentially going back to AD 600. What the research on the stone collars with their attached large three-pointed semi-idols also suggests is that the chiefs of Borigeng had produced a significantly greater number and stylistic diversity of these and with greater craftsmanship than the chiefs of Eastern Hispaniola had. The dates point to between 450 and 800 years of sustained, intense relationships between the two areas, more than enough to create a fairly dense web of descent-related chiefly lineages. That being the case, the collars and attached three-pointers circulated only among these related chiefly lineages that had deep genealogical history between them. That the stone collars and three-pointers do not extend outside this region, i.e. Casimujigüe, indicates that, historically, the interaction of the chiefs of Boriquén and Higüe with other caciques in the rest of Hispaniola was likely to be perceived as one that engaged foreigners, perhaps even strangers. Those chiefly clans and groups that had separate descent origins, such as is further suggested by the presence of different languages and ethnic groups of Hispaniola, for example, the Macorish, Siguayo, and the diverse mosaic of Tainos. If the stone collars and the attached three-pointers are objects that enable chiefly political power, it's interesting that the polities on eastern Hispaniola and Boriquén in 450, or a maximum of 800 years, did not expand outside the Casimujigüe region or beyond the Virgin Islands. In section 18b, we already saw that the stone collars reached only some of the Virgin Islands, and the farther into the Lesser Antilles proposed buffer zone, large three-pointed embedded in Chican Ostianoi context extended only to Anguilla, but in absence of stone collars. For other caciques of Hispaniola and other political leaders further afield, Cuba, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and most of the Lesser Antilles, neither the stone collars nor the elbow stones were part of the arsenal or ensemble of potent objects of political religious power. That the stone collars and three-pointers, attached or not, do not occur in, for example, the Bainoa, Marien, Magua, or Maguana Callabo chiefdoms also supports the idea that stone collars and elbow stones were neither stolen by these chiefs, nor would they be gifted to chiefly groups outside the deeply and historically intertwined web of chiefs of Eastern Hispaniola and Boriquén. The circulation would have to be through inheritance by heirs, and perhaps as a bride's payment to her relatives, but mostly they would remain, quote, in-house, end quote within the closely knit web of related chiefs. This does not preclude that internal factional competition among the closely knit chiefs could not occur and result in the theft of stone collars and attached semi-idols. With at least 450 years of time, I would be surprised that such cleavages did not occasionally occur. I suspect that Oviedo's mention of bequests of the state of a cacique to foreign caciques invited to the funerary feast would also apply to these caciques who shared generations of exchanging brides across the Mona and Virgin Island passages. Instead, with truly foreign and stranger caciques, other kinds of powerful semi-idols and potent icons, such as the Guaisas, would be more likely exchanged. This, I believe, is a powerful argument to speak not about a, quote, classic Taino, end quote, culture, but of different ways in which Native actors participated in and defined their Taino-ness. The web of relations proposed above is but one of various ways of defining Taino-ness, this one operating in a circumscribed region, being Eastern Hispaniola to Puerto Rico to the Virgin Islands with the Anguilla Outlier. 
But at the same time, it is also important to emphasize that other networks did exist linking the natives of, say, the rest of Hispaniola, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. Tainones, like ethnicity, is not a checklist of traits, but entirely a matter of different sets of interactions simultaneously operating with more or less intensity during a given span of time. Thus, the consideration of the temporality of such relations is as important as its spatial extension. Alas, peace would not last much longer in Boriquen after the arrival of Ponce de Leon in Sotomayor. In Shakespearean Argo, 1510 was the, quote, winter of discontent, end quote, in Boriquen. The caciques and natives assigned by King Ferdinand to the conquistadors had grown wary of their abuse and mistreatment, most specifically those assigned to Sotomayor and his men. A royal decree from King Ferdinand had originally assigned Sotomayor the, quote, best cacique, end quote, from Boriquen. This, quote, best cacique, end quote, was Aguaybana the first, the elder. But Diego Colón, in his capacity as governor of the Indies, whose rights had just been partly reinstated in 1509, quickly modified Sotomayor's encomienda to replace the, quote, best cacique, end quote, for another cacique, which turned out to be the brother of Aguaybana I and 300 of his Indians. Aguaybana I was apparently reassigned to Ponce de Leon, Ponce de Leon, but not for long. He died sometime in 1510. However, Sotomayor was unhappy and restless with Don Diego's change via Juan Serón in his allotment of Indians. In keeping with native etiquette, this brother of Aguaybana I, i.e. the future Aguaybana II, and Sotomayor became Guatiao by exchanging names and also by Aguaybana's offering his sister to be Sotomayor's mistress. In any event, it is clear from Sotomayor's subsequent actions that what he considered his right to extract labor was miles apart from what Aguaybana II and the other caciques understood the pact to entail. Sotomayor was unhappy that a number of the caciques, who in his view were obligated to supply labor and goods, for example, cassava bread, were refusing to do so. Things took a turn for the worse when both Aguaybana I and his mother, Doña Inés, died of natural causes sometime midway through 1510. As the brother of the dead cacique, Aguaybana II inherited the office. He was encomedado to Sotomayor while the latter still resided in the village of Tabora. This second round of assignments involving natives of the south and southwest of the island was granted to the vecinos, settlers and neighbors, of Guanica by Diego Colón's envoy, the newly appointed lieutenant governor of Boriquen, Juan Serón. It was this second repartimiento that truly sparked the first serious spate of troubles and confrontations that led to the general rebellion by the end of the year in 1509. This second repartimiento caused great unrest among the caciques and the first violent skirmishes with the Spaniards. For example, Diego de Cuellar, one of the original vecinos of Guanica, declared, quote, that having Don Cristobal ordered to round up and pacify certain caciques and bring them back to servitude, a cacique named Huyucoa, a principal person, defended himself and fractured or injured my left eye for which reason I lost sight, end quote. In a second inquest, Diego de Cuellar presented testimony, again restating that, quote, he was fighting in a war where his finger was broken and that after broken, he tied his finger and hand to the sword and continued fighting, that it was public and notorious that Cacique Utuoya fractured his eye with a macana, which is a wooden war club, end quote. The relocation of the village of Tavora had been determined by the tense climate with the neighboring caciques resisting the encomenda, coupled with its inconvenient placement to access gold-bearing river areas. This settlement was renamed Villa de Sotomayor and established near the mouth of the Guaurabo River in Añasco. The tensions that accumulated through the year 1510 also included the importation of enslaved natives from the neighboring islands. Um, like Vieques, St. Croix, and the Virgin Islands. Not surprisingly, Sotomayor was among the first to receive license to enslave these, the so-called Caribes or Canibales, from the Lesser Antilles, by now labeled as the Islas Inutiles, or Useless Islands, in Juan de las Cosas's 1500 chart. The incident between Diego Cuellar and Cacique Huyucoa, or Utuyoa, apparently a subordinate of Aguaybana, 
was but one of a growing spate of such confrontations. With the death of Agüemena I and his mother, Doña Inés, and the mounting troubles generated by the encomienda activities of Sotomayor and his men, the effects of the raids bringing captive Indians from neighboring islands to the east, the increasing competition between Ponce de Leon and Diego Colón and his lieutenants, not to mention the delayed effects of two seasons of hurricanes, the air was dense with resentment on all sides and primed for armed conflicts. There was, however, one matter that from the natives' perspective, had to be resolved before they would fully commit to war against the Spaniards. From what the Indians of the islands of San Juan had heard of the conquests and wars that took place on the island of Hispaniola, they believed that Christians could not have possibly conquered it had they not been immortal and incapable of dying from wounds or other disaster, and that since they had come from the direction of the sunrise, they fought the way they did, and that they were a celestial people and children of the sun, and Indians were powerless to hurt them. And when they saw that Christians made themselves masters of the island, the Indians determined not to allow themselves to be subjugated by such a small number of persons, and thus they wished to secure their freedom and not serve them, even though they feared them and thought they were immortal. And when the senores of the island had secret secretly assembled, they decided to put this question to a test and resolve their doubts and to carry out an experiment on some stray Christian. The secret war council meeting of caciques of the caciques was held in the winter of 1510, possibly in the settlement of Agüebana II, most probably located somewhere near Villa de Sotomayor. As I see it, the question was not so much about the immortality of the Spanish, but rather to investigate whether the whether the Spanish experienced death in a way that was different from that of the caciques, recall the natives' multinatural perspective and partable individual personhood. Such a secret meeting falls squarely in the cabildo, or council, type of meetings described earlier where, in this case, an assembly of caciques would have gathered to perform a cojoba ceremony in order to consult with the semis and divine about two major questions. Will we be victorious in war? And how can we be sure that the Spanish died and, quote, death, end quote, meant signs that showed a permanent change of state from living to non-living, the mode of bodily corruption, and that the soul of the living is replaced by that of the dead, operito or opia. Given what has been learned about the crucial role of semi-idols and spirits in the process of such momentous decision-making, I have no doubt that they were consulted and that a cojoba ceremony did take place, even though the chroniclers do not mention it. It is evident that the semi supported their plan to ambush an unsuspecting Spaniard and test his manner of death, likely divining a favorable future outcome. This event highlights how important were the semi idols and spirits who made themselves present via cojoba hallucinogenic visions in determining major policy decisions and why caciques like Agüemena II had to have those prestigious and powerful senior idols who could deliver positive results. In that secret meeting, it was resolved that Cacique Urayoan, who commanded the region of Yagüeca, located in western Puerto Rico, would carry out the test of mortality, whereas Agüemena II would do much the same with Cristobal de Sotomayor and his men. As it happened, Urayoan offered an unlucky young Spanish traveler named Salcedo some 15 or 20 Indian porters to continue his voyage, and sure enough, he was drowned in the Guaurabo River. After the kill, Urayoan sent Indians every day for three days to verify the process of decomposition, and on the third day went to witness the result himself. The key factor was not that Salcedo was killed, but that his body was left to rot for three full days before he was declared, quote, not living, end quote. I agree with Edwin Crespo that body putrefaction was the key indicator, quote, of the undeniable fact of death, end quote, from the natives' perspective. The reality of the corruption of the Spaniard's body milita militated against the idea that all Spaniards somehow experienced a process of death or of transformation of their guaisa, i.e. their living soul, into opia, in a fundamentally different manner than ordinary native human beings did. It also seemed that the same experiment was attempted at least once before the Yagüeca incident by the cacique of, Aymanio re of the Aymanio region in the autumn of 1510. The life of a Spaniard named Juarez was put up by the cacique as a price or bet in a ball game, with the right to kill him going to the victorious team. However, Juarez was rescued at the last minute by Diego de Sala Salazar, thanks to the betrayal of an Aboria Indian who was assigned to Juarez's service. 
As Juarez was tied up and imprisoned in a house, it's likely that this was an early but failed attempt to ritually execute a Spaniard and test his manner of death. But it could also have been a show of defiance and resistance against the encomendero, Juarez's father, who was one of Soto Yamayore's men. In an event, in any event, to in any event, the miraculous and single-handed rescue of Juarez by the sword of Sarasar against so many Indians may have lent credence to the general belief held by the Tainos that the Spaniards somehow had a different and more powerful nature than theirs, hence the subsequent test by Urayoang, who indeed proved their fears wrong. I can imagine hearing them claim, the Spaniards rot like we do. I do not think the natives ever regarded the Spaniards as deities or divine entities. Rather, the Spaniards, like the caciques or shamans, would be seen as having control over numinous things, like iron swords, harcubuses, a precursor of the rifle, okay, glass beads, horses, and so on, all of which were exotic things and beings that made them powerful. And because their physique alone would decidedly put the Spaniards in a category of, quote, others, end quote, it's not surprising that questions arose about the nature of their persons and their bodies, about how they were composed in life and decomposed death and were recomposed in the afterlife. There is no indication that a Spaniard was treated as a semi, i.e. a living divinity. The best data on this question comes from the engagement of the natives of Cuba near Bayamo and the Spaniards involving both native semi-icons and spirits and the Christian icons to be analyzed in sections 20 to 22. That the start of the military rebellion did not follow immediately after these initial tests demonstrates the great caution exercised by the caciques of Borinque in facing the Spaniards. In any event, Aguevara II, who was an important cacique, was the one who led the ultimate key test. This happened, quote, casi al principio, end quote, or almost at the beginning of 1511, and after the secret council meeting with the other caciques of Borinque. The chronicles did not say where the council meeting was held, perhaps in the Yagueca region, or more likely in Aguevana's territory of Guainia. In any case, it's known that the failed attempt in Amanillo took place three months earlier than the execution of Sotomayor and his men ordered by Aguevana II. This event either followed or was contemporaneous to the Juarez incident in Yagueca. Aguevana II, like Urayoyang, was also ready to test the mortality of Cristobal de Sotomayor, who by then had evidently broken all of the expectations of reciprocity entailed by the pact cemented by name exchange and sister-slash-wife-giving. Since during the secret council meeting, the Samis had revealed their support and expectation of future success in battling the Spaniards, it's not surprising to find out that a major areto ceremony was enchanted, was enacted to chant and dance in celebration of the death of Sotomayor, although he was, from our Western perspective, still alive. That he was regarded as good as dead before the fact was because the Yagueca test had already been performed and had confirmed that Sotomayor's manner of death or body putrefaction would be like that of any Indian. And because during the Cojoba ceremony in the midst of hallucinatory visions, the Semis had confirmed to Aguevana that Sotomayor and his men were, quote, dead, end quote. But prior to the Areto ceremony, the life of Sotomayor was also ritually gambled in absentia, in a rubber ball game where the victorious players earned the right to ambush and kill the Spaniards. Despite Sotomayor being forewarned, he dismissed the warning as hearsay and departed with a number of Aguevana's Indian porters towards Caparra. The ambush was set to go. Aguevana II and his warriors reached the Spanish caravan at the Caullo River, perhaps today's Yauco. There, Sotomayor and his men were killed by blows from macanas and by arrows. Though not mentioned by Spanish chroniclers, it's likely that, as in the Yagüeca incident, the Spaniards were left to rot for several days to check on the process of putrefaction. Sotomayor was later found by the Spanish sent by Juan Ponce de Leon to have been clumsily buried, feet exposed, next to the river. Sotomayor's death was quickly followed by the sacking and burning at high noon of the Villa de Sotomayor, making the start of the island-wide rebellion. The Indians of this island rebelled on a Friday, almost at the beginning of the year 1511. They saw that the Spanish, being few in number, 
were dispersed throughout the island. Thus, each cacique killed those that were in his respective house or land, so that they killed 80 Christians or more at the same time. And cacique Agüevana, who was also named Don Cristobal as the most principled of them, ordered another cacique named Guarionesh that he go as captain and gathered all the caciques to go and burn the new town called Sotomayor. And they attacked suddenly and immediately set the town on fire and killed some Christians. The sequence leading to general battle is clear. First, the decision to go to war depended on testing the nature of Spanish mortality, which would be acted upon only after a secret council meeting of the rebel chiefs involving a cojoba ceremony and consultation with the semi-idols and spirits supported such risky action. This was followed by a ball game, or bate, in which the lives of the Spanish targets would be played for in absentia. The game most likely decided which warrior player team earned the right to join the ambush team. Next, a war, a war areto feast celebrated both the death of the Spanish and the prowess and wisdom of the cacique Agüevana and his semiified ancestors. Only after all these ceremonies were concluded was the actual ambush and execution carried out. The final phase involved the confirmation that the nature of mortality and bodily transformation from living to a non-living being and soul was as expected. An advanced degree of putrefaction confirmed that this individual soul had already departed to the land of the non-living, the Coave, the place where the dead souls resided. With these results in hand, each cacique in their respective regions would likewise order ball games and areto ceremonies to celebrate the anticipated death of the Spaniards. Only then would they proceed to an island-wide rise in arms and battle against the Spaniards. It is at this juncture, at the beginning of 1511, that the synchronized rise throughout Borigeng took place. Immediately before, or in synchrony with the general rise to arms, Agüevana II had sent Cacique Guarionesh, one of several known caciques in the Otoao or Utuado region, as a captain to round up all the caciques to join forces in order to attack and burn the village of Sotomayor. Suez Vadillo reports that 30 cedulas reales, or royal decrees, against the rebel caciques were emitted, suggesting that at least that many caciques responded to Agüevana's call for arms. Oviedo noted that in the first large battle, when the Villa de Sotomayor was born, some 3,000 Indian troops were deployed, resulting in the death of at least 80 Spaniards, which accounted for perhaps more than half of the island's Spanish population at the time. However, Diego de Salazar and a few Spaniards were able to escape towards the Royal Hacienda of Toa on the north coast and alert Ponce de Leon. The first Spanish reprisal took place on the mouth of the Cuayuco River, quote, in the land of Agüevana, end quote, who by then was supported by, quote, many Indians, including Caribes and Flecheros, who wielded bow and arrows tipped with poison, from the nearby islands who had joined, end quote, the battle. It was the first defeat in battle for the rebel caciques. The second battle erupted in the region of Aymaco to the northwest, where cacique Mabodomaca had assembled about 600 warriors. Sent ahead of the main troops, commanded by Ponce de Leon, Diego Salazar confronted Mabodomaca's warriors, resulting in the death of 150 natives. A cacique, perhaps Mabodomaca himself, recognized by his guaní, or Tumbaga gold, pectoral, i.e. a guaisa, was killed by Salazar in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which led to the surrender of the remaining natives. Another confrontation took place in the region of Yagüeca, where more than 11,000 native troops had assembled, possibly led by Cacique Urayoang, against some 80 to 100 Spaniards. Here, the troops were taunting each other. Neither side committed to an all-right, committed to an all-right, all-out war. When a Spaniard harquebus shot and killed an Indian, quote, and it was thought that he was a very principal man, end quote, because the native warriors, despite such numerical superiority, retract, retracted and so did the Spanish. A second round of raids and skirmishes erupted in 1513, in part fueled by Ponce de Leon leaving Caparra to explore Florida after Don Diego named first Cerón and then Moscoso as lieutenant governors. Spanish chroniclers recorded the term postrera guerra, or posterior war, for that period following the 1511 uprise. It was in great measure fueled because the Spanish administration, administrative attention was fully on San Germán, the settlement erected on the ashes of Villa de Sotomayor, or Partido de San Germán, 
while Caparra, the seat of the eastern insular jurisdiction, or Partido de Caparra, was left unattended and exposed. Doubtless, this was an opportunity for the rebellious caciques in the east and southeast. Caparra was sacked and burned by local rebels, who formed an alliance with natives from the northeastern Antilles, which would be St. Croix and the Virgin Islands, perhaps even other islands farther south. Even though the Spanish labeled many of these as, quote, Caribes, end quote, most were probably natives of Puerto Rico in confederation with leaders from the Virgin Islands, perhaps including groups from the buffer zone of the northeastern Caribbean. Just days before the attack on Caparra, the rebels attacked a brigantine ship edging along the salt marshes of Abe, or Yabe, near modern Santa Isabel in South Puerto Rico. In that period, numerous dispersed Spanish farmsteads and homesteads throughout southeastern Puerto Rico were sacked by the natives and abandoned. As well, there had been a punitive expedition led by Cacique Casimar of Vieque Island, today Vieques, against settlements of caciques who were loyal to the Spanish resulting in the sacking and killing of Chiefess Luisa of Aymanillo, near today's village of Loisa. After the incident, Governor Cristobal de Mendoza persecuted the rebels all the way back to Vieques Island, quote, killing Cacique Yahurebo, a brother of Casimar. His village was ransacked and 12 canoes were destroyed. One canoe was so beautifully sculptured, though, that the governor took it as a trophy for Admiral Diego Colon, end quote. While the Spaniards blamed the foreign, quote, Carib, end quote, islanders, they nonetheless or organized counteroffensive expeditions against local settlements in the eastern half of the island. In labeling the attackers from the east and the Virgin Islands as Caribes, the Spanish conveniently justified their enslavement. This meant that these natives would become private property and would be exploited at the owner's pleasure, unlike the case of Ecomienda or Assignment, which, despite abuses, still had royal, quote, strings, end quote, attached. These raids to capture Indians as slaves, the famous Calvagadas, became a prevalent mode of pacification from 1513 until about 1519. For example, Cabal... Cabalgadas. Cabalgadas were directed against Cacique Don Alonso of Otoao, near present-day Don Alonso district in Utuado, and Cacique Orocovis in the Central Highland, a region today known as Orocovis, and even into a as yet unexplored territory such as Daguao and Humacao, located, located to the southeast of the island. As Suen Badillo noted, eventually a total of 16 insurgent caciques, quote, were exiled to Hispaniola without having any further information of their fate, end quote. Most were probably executed. Pockets of resistance throughout Borigang and the ensuing punitive cabalgadas were to continue well into 1518. At that time, reports were being received in Santo Domingo that still complained about the natives being on the run. The beginning of the end of the rebellion of the caciques began in January 1519, a fateful year when smallpox spread like wildfire throughout Hispaniola and Puerto Rico. The pandemic broke down any armed resistance that the native rebels might have had in store. However, from the Windward Islands, natives did organize raiding parties to attack the Spanish in Puerto Rico through most of the 16th century, for which there are records for 1515, 1520, 1529, 1530, 1534, 1553, 1567, and 1578. Contrary to Suez Badillo's opinion, the natives from places like Guadalupe, Martinique, and Dominica were far removed from the shared social cultural identity, or Tainones, of the native groups of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. The Windward natives were not merely Tainos, who had been branded as Carib for political reasons. One of the consequences of the Cabalgadas right after 1511 in Puerto Rico was that enslaved Indians and whatever war booty was publicly auctioned would be subject to taxation, or the, quote, royal fifth, end quote. Some of these documents have survived, providing some tantalizing details of what was taken from the Indians and details about the enslaved. For instance, from the booty collected by Captain Salazar, there is a list of Indian slaves and items sold in auction that were taken from a hague, or subterranean cave, belonging to a cacique mabo, which included among the items, quote, do figura de arete, or two statues, end quote, and quote, una agua de 
arete, end quote, one female loincloth, sold for a total of seven tomines and 14 granos. For a discussion of monetary values, see Gelpi Baiz, 2000, pages 121 to 126. We're not going to do that. Anyway, the first one... The first one undoubtedly refers to a pair of idols that the Spanish associated with aretos, perhaps suggesting that the semi-icons were publicly displayed in ceremonial aretos. The other item refers to the loincloths, or naguas, worn by women participating in aretos. The auction of semi-idols is thus direct evidence of the capture of symbols of native religion and political power. This pair of figures must have been of enough value or curiosity to the Spaniards to end up in public auction rather than being destroyed. The fact that Cacique Mabo had these and other items stowed away in a higüe confirms that valuables, especially semi-icons, would often be hidden to avoid theft. In the five Spanish documents published by Vicente Murga Sanz, listing the auctioned war booty, other goods included hammocks, fishing nets, cotton sashes and belts, maos, or perhaps breastplates used in wars, fool's gold or pyrite, and a stone necklace found, quote, en uno carelle, end quote, uh, meaning in some carapaces of care. Care is the loggerhead turtle. It will not come as a surprise that the rebellion of the caciques of Boriquen, particularly in the early phases, which were from 1510 to 1511, spurred the caciques of the Higüe to once again conspire against the Spanish and their region. Friars of the Hierny, Hi- Hyernimite, I don't know, order arrived in Santo Domingo on December 20, 1516 to evaluate and come up with solutions regarding the acute problems of the state of indigenous labor assignments, the political turmoil generated between the newcomer colonists and the grip on power by the veteran conquistador elite gathered around Diego Colón, and the precarious state of food production on the island. They acted as judges and were the powerful de facto governing body at least until 1519. An inquest took place, reported in 1517, to evaluate, quote, the opinions that were given by the Spanish residents about the manner in which the Indians of of these islands should be treated, end quote, reorganized and administered. Opinion was sought among a select group of the conquistadors who had been in Hispaniola from the very early days. It is in this document where direct evidence of the links between caciques of Higüe and the Agüebanas of Boriquen can be found. One witness in particular, Marcos de Aguilar, a veteran conquistador, testifies that, quote, after this witness arrived to this island, being Hispaniola, as a magistrate, he knew how, he knew about how a cacique, being Agüebana II, in the island of San Juan, killed Don Cristobal de Sotomayor and other Christians in a place called Jauca, or Gaullo in other documents, in the island of San Juan. This was learned later by Cacique Andres, who now serves His Royal Highness, who was a relative of the other Cacique who had killed Don Cristobal. The said Cacique Andres assembled in his house all the Caciques and many peoples of this province of Higüe to celebrate with great feast and joy the victory that the Indians of San Juan had against the Christians. And when in such a state many caciques assemble, they, as usual, always discuss things against the Christians. They agreed among themselves, saying that if Agüebana killed the Christians in the island of San Juan, they should also do the same, because the Indians were already manicatos, which means eforzao, um, i.e. authoritative or backed by the force of law, according to Corrubius Orozco, 1611, Dictionary. Okay, whatever. Uh, clearly, the good news about Sotomayor and his men's mortality and the initial successes of the rebellion in Puerto Rico had rapidly reached Agüebana's relative, Cacique Andres, in the Higüe. This prompted a meeting of the caciques of the Higüe to celebrate the victory of their allies and relatives in Puerto Rico and also emboldened them to plot a conspiracy at home. In fact, it's not far fetched to assume that the message sent by Agüebana II was a call to expand the battlefront from Boriquen to the Higüe and beyond throughout Hispaniola. Agüebana II must have been aware of the benefits of cutting off the Spanish flow with supplies being shipped from Spanish port towns like Salvaleón, or Boca del Yuma, and Santo Domingo. 
Be that as it may, the same witness, Aguilar, tells how the call for rebellion would be sent via messengers to the caciques quartered in their respective settlements in the Higüe region. The message consisted of a specific date when selected caciques would enter the village of Salvaleón, where they would start a fire into which a poison is prepared, into which a poison prepared by the bojites would arise as a toxic smoke and kill the inhabitants. Indeed, evidence that natives knew about chemical warfare tactics. The plan also called for other caciques to simultaneously hit the city of Santo Domingo and other localities throughout Hispaniola. Sadly for the Tainoan freedom fighters, the plot was discovered by the Spanish and quashed before it even germinated. The events in Boriquen recorded by the Spanish chroniclers have provided one context, warfare and acute political crisis in which the semi-idols were invoked, consulted, and engaged by the military elite, primarily caciques, in central council meetings. These icons, as well as the semi-spirits, as well as semi-spirits or a hallucinogenic visions, or as hallucinogenic visions, were instrumental in engaging the Spanish in battle, not the least of which involved the certification that the Spaniards experienced the process of death in a similar manner to the Aborigines. The battles on both fronts also brought forth the nature of the alliances made between the caciques of the two islands through blood relations, intermarriage, or Guatial Pacts. It also showed the order of ceremonial and ritual protocols followed from the Cojoba to consult the semi-idols to the ball games to select the warring parties, and then the Areto celebrating the victory predicted by the semis. The battles in Higüe and Boriquen bring to the fore the socio-political and inter-insular connections in which semi-icons of various kinds and on occasion included those one might think of as inalienable, were exchanged and circulated. Part of the semi-idols circulating within the, and between the two insular regions went hand in hand with the exchange of wives, establishing political bonds between Affine, who would also be Guatiao. With the death of the cacique, with the death of cacique as a result of the war, some of these icons would also be bequeathed to foreign caciques and allies. Given the close relationships among chiefs across the Mona Passage, these icons would also flow between Boriquen and the Higüe. Okay, guys, we're getting pretty close to the hour mark, so I'm going to go ahead and stop here at Part C for us to start on in the next video.